Okay. I'm TJ. I am the president of the Dude from Beach Historical Society, and I'm going to make just a few little announcements. One, we're thrilled that you're all here today. Um, the support for our our uh, historical society over the last year has just grown, and these lectures are fabulous, um, and we really appreciate it. Um, a few little announcements. One. Um, we're trying to get, if you want to know about more things that are going on at the Historical Society, we have a ledger where if you can just give, if you're already on our email list, don't worry about it, but for people who want to get our stuff, just give us your email uh, and we'll send you on our list and you'll get an update of what's going on. Um, if anybody wants to become a member, the memberships still are cheap. Um, How much? $25 is for an individual membership. They're going to be going up the first of the year. 26? But let me mention two other things. We are, again, after the COVID uh, hiatus, uh, hiatus, uh, hiatus, hiatus. 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 Um, we're going to have breakfast with Santa. It's coming up. It's going to be the first uh, Saturday in December. I think it's December 4th. Um, Y'all come, and especially if you know kids that want, we want to really encourage other kids to go. Also, if um, you're an adult and you want to have cocktails with Santa, that will be the following Thursday. So that will be here. The cool thing about Breakfast with Santa this year is it's all going to be underneath the big banyan tree. There's going to be arts and crafts. There's going to be um, uh, cocktail breakfast and Santa, and it's one of our most popular events. That's going to be back on. Um, all right, I would like to introduce Ms. Amy K. Tanner. Amy is our historian. She has been um, a founding member, her family's been a founding member, not unlike our speaker today, Mr. Dietrich. Anyway, uh, Amy's going to introduce Ed. Uh, why don't you come up and introduce Ed? who made an impact in, in honor of Veterans Day. People from Deerfield who made an impact on, on our commitment uh, to the activities in World War II. And uh, I, I want to tell you just a little bit about a person, one of the most unassuming people you would ever meet. Uh, he was the little brother of Bink Glisson, Arthur Glisson, who Bink turned his 60 plus years collection of Florida stuff into Yesteryear Village, which is at uh, Palm Beach County Fairgrounds. And uh, he was an amazing man. And his little brother was equally amazing. Uh, Roy Glisson was a realtor locally. Uh, Eddie just told me that they bought their property from Roy, Roy Glisson. Uh, I worked with him for a lot of years. My father was uh, the uh, part, uh, partner in, in his, uh, was a salesman in his realty. And uh, he, they put together a lot of projects, securing the property and putting together financing. When there was some, something called First Federal of Miami, they, <laughs> they, they financed most of Florida in the 60s and early 70s. And I knew, I knew Roy all this time uh, for years and years and until he retired to Weston. But I never knew uh, until later that Roy Glisson was in the Army, in the U.S. Army, he was in the Philippines. And uh, he brought out the Supreme Japanese General, and I'm going to really try not to butcher the name, I've been practicing all day, Tama, Tama, Kuchi Yamashita. He was the he was the supreme general, and when Roy brought him out of the jungle, and he would only surrender his his arms to Roy Glisson. So when they did the big surrender thing, uh, the little the little backwoods boy from Florida uh, accepted his pistol, and. Uh, he had that till his dying day, and now I think it's in Binks, Binks uh, uh, Museum. So uh, you, you just never know what is here right around you. So that's why you need to meet your neighbors. 
you really do, you can't. I know this is the age where I don't know who lives next door. I do. I know everybody lives on my street. Kind of, except somebody speaks himself. But anyway, I want to tell you about somebody else I know. I well, think your daddy. A most remarkable woman. Uh, I had the privilege to work with her for a lot of years with the Historical Society. When we were just starting up, when somebody said, hey, well, if you were a 501 c 3 I'd give you this house. Okay. <laughs> Be right with you. Be right with you. And uh, well, they had Deerfield Builders right over here. And they, uh, after about 25 years and everything, they started putting a sign out there would say 25th year. You know, it started in 1947, 25th year. So every day when I went to work, I saw how old I was. <laughs> I started. They opened Deerfield Builders the year I was born. I'm sure that's why they did it that year. But, uh, it, it, was, it was there every morning. So, but it, it always made me smile. So I want to introduce you to Ed, Ed I'm sorry, Eddie goes way back. Ed Dietrich and his beautiful family that's here. We're so lucky to have him in our organization. Uh, like TJ said, he and I are founding members. They can't get rid of us. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? They can't get rid of us. So one of the most wonderful men I know, and his beautiful family, oh. Eddie D Ed Dietrich. Thank you, sister. Yeah, yeah. I have the, uh, the privilege to call him my little brother. <laughs> little brother, get that. When my dad heard that you were born, yeah. he said, I think we better open up a lumberyard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I remember. I don't that right away. First order of business. Uh, if there are any veterans present, please rise and be recognized. Okay. Thank you, sir. Oh. Thank you. This is a lecture. You're allowed to take notes. There will be a test. <laughs> which time you may not refer to your notes. So just keep that in mind. Uh, I'm going to tell you a story about an epic uh, worldwide conflict. World War II, Second World War, however you want to refer to it. I'm also going to tell you that involved tens of millions of people, as we all know, worldwide. I'm also going to tell you about two people who were a little bit a part of that. And they represent the love story part of what I'm going to tell you about uh, today. So you've heard a little bit about uh, Emily Dietrich, <coughs> uh, co-founder with many others, Historical Society. I see the Briggs uh, family back in the back. The best. With Margaret. The best. <coughs> um, she was the city's first historian. She did a lot of things on uh, up front. She started the first uh, Girl Scout troop. She was the leader of the Friends of the Library, the Percy White Library is uh, much uh, her responsibility making that happen. She did a lot of other things behind the scenes too. Deerfield Island Park, she was poking and prodding the authorities to get that done for many years. So <clears throat> Emily, uh, again, a, a kind of an integral part of our family fabric uh, in Deerfield. Uh, I'll tell you about Ed Dietrich <clears throat> in Deerfield. Uh, he came here out of the Pacific after the end of the, uh, World War II. I uh, went to work for Wilbur Kretz and W.A. Hart down in Fort Lauderdale. They were building uh, co-ops and apartment buildings down there. Uh, they, he went out a couple days a week swinging a hammer. He was their accountant. He was their engineer. Uh, they sent him up to little old Hamlet in Deerfield and said, you know, we're having a hard time getting building materials, particularly concrete blocks. They decided to open up a concrete block plant. So, Ed Dietrich, Wilbur Kretz, and W.A. Hart started Deerfield Builder Supply. <clears throat> they, uh, by the way, Hart and Kretz were uh, involved in the construction of the U.S. Army Airfield in Boca Raton, by the way, so they a lot of history. They built the airfields in Brazil and the Azores as well. So, uh, so all of a sudden, hey, come on in. <clears throat> so Ed is here in Deerfield. Family still in Fort Lauderdale. Eventually, we moved up here in, in the early 50s. The Ed uh, was a co-founder of the Chamber of Commerce and later its president. Uh, very much involved with the Lions Club and the Kiwanis Club, all of these community uh, organizations. He was a city commissioner. And if you get a chance to enjoy our beautiful beach, 
you can thank Ed Dietrich and Otis Tanner for that because they were the commissioners that ramrodded that project. It would never happen nowadays, by the way, with all of our environmental re regulations. <laughs> and I apologize to the town of Hillsborough Beach for stealing all their sand. <laughs> Be that as it may. Uh, a little bit more back on Emily. Emily was a Florida cracker. She was born in West Palm Beach in December of 1916. She was born in her grandparents' house right up the hill from what is now the Kravitz Center in West Palm. She, <clears throat> her grandfather, Otto Olson, was a federal marshal in the Dakota Territories uh, and an itinerant Methodist preacher. <laughs> Uh, he eventually uh, retired, moved to Milwaukee, got bored, and joined the Milwaukee Police Force. Somewhere along the line in the early 1900s, he and his wife, Emily, and their kids, who uh, down here, the two sons, who had been born in Wisconsin, uh, they came down here, took up residence. Uh, Emily came along in 1916. Uh, in 1912, Otto built them a house on old military trail. Uh, we all know military trail. If if you go anywhere past <clears throat> I-95 in your travels. Old Military Trail was built back in the 1830s during the Second Seminole Indian War. It was only paved about 25 years ago when Emily was growing up and even as a kid going out there myself with my sisters, uh, the Shell Rock Road still had the wagon wheel ruts from the artillery and the baggage trains back from the, literally back from the 1830s. So, a lot of presence back in the day. Emily was a graduate of Palm Beach High School and then attended Palm Beach Junior College. We now know it as Palm Beach State College. She then went on to Florida State College for Women where she graduated for, from when she was 20 years old. Back in those days, if you were a good student, you got to skip grades. So she skipped a couple <laughs> during her time coming up so she got out of college uh, pretty early. She then started her career in teaching uh, in High Springs and then on Gasparilla Island at the Boca Grande High School. Now, we're gonna circle back to that as part of our love story, just a moment. <laughs> so, uh, Ed Dietrich, uh, you just heard about his presence in Deerfield. He was born in Salamanca, New York, up in uh, the Allegheny Mountains on the uh, Seneca Iroquois Indian Reservation. Uh, he is an honorary uh, Seneca Iroquois. His uh, dear cousin, who he was had a lifelong friendship with, uh, Thomas Youngblood was half Iroquois, and Thomas recruited him into the tribe. <clears throat> Back in the day, he was an outstanding student, a super musician, and you'll hear a little bit more about that uh, later on as well. But the, uh, he was really wanting to get a, an appointment to the Naval Academy. That was his dream. But <coughs> those are hard to come by. So he was waiting and waiting. In the meantime, he's out of high school, graduated with honors, got a music scholarship to Ohio, Univer Ohio Northern University. So he's off doing that, waiting for his appointment to the Naval Academy, which he finally got in 1936. Before that, he had been down here visiting family in uh, Lake Worth, uh, the rich family from Buffalo. Uh, if you know anything about uh, dairy products and frozen foods, you will know about the, the rich family. I'm trying to get them to adopt me, by the way. <laughs> 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 Uh, at any rate, the uh, ice cream and dairy products uh, factory in West Palm is still there, going strong 80 or 90 years later. So Ed is down here visiting his relatives, particularly Willard Rich, his cousin. Willard's girlfriend, Martha Roberts, happens to be Emily Olson's best friend. So, yeah, blind date, love at first sight. Well, at least for Ed it was. <laughs> Not sure about Emily, but uh, he, the pursuit was on and the, uh, the relationship blossomed over literally whirlwind romance uh, over a period of four and a half years. Mm -hmm. Is that a whirlwind? I don't think so. <laughs> anyway, finally, uh, so Emily's at Florida State. Ed uh, matriculates to the United States Naval Academy. <clears throat> you will see a picture here of the battleship New York on their summer cruise after his first year there, three month uh, cruise, which was pretty typical. That's the battleship New York transiting the Kaiser Wilhelm Canal in Germany. When this picture is taken, Ed is on there somewhere. <laughs> so <clears throat> when these training cruises took place, the, you know, you've got the crew of the ship, in the, in the case of a battleship, probably 1,800, 1,900 uh, sailors and officers. Not enough room for the poor midshipmen, so Ed slept in a hammock 
for most of three months inside the 14-inch gun turret, of which there were five on this ship. So he said it was great because you didn't get seasick, because you're always, you know. You know. <clears throat> so Ed, Ed's on the New York. He's there. Uh, next year, he's back. He gets uh, appendicitis and a very serious eye infection. The standards for remaining as a midshipman at the academy or a cadet at the military academy, any of those places, very, very strenuous. He was uh, uh, discharged, uh, medical discharge, and went off to the University of Michigan the following year. So he was very sad about that event, but it didn't stop his dream. So again, his musical talents took him to the University of Michigan on scholarship. Uh, later on, he was able to join the officer training program at Northwestern University. This was in the summer of 1940, so he was just kind of following up behind his classmates and was commissioned an ensign uh, in January of 1941 and had some additional training. In the meantime, the correspondence between he and Emily is going pretty fast and furious. She's at Boca Grande. By the way, back then, the only way you could get to Gasparilla Island was by boat or by the phosphate train. There was a big phosphate discharge port there that took phosphate from the phosphate mines in Polk County, took them by train out to the port at Boca Grande, and then shipped literally all over the world, including Japan, although that didn't last too much longer, <laughs> as we will find out. Uh, so, Emily's on Boca Grande, Ed's just got his commission. He goes to Buffalo, buys a brand new Oldsmobile for 600 bucks. No, no. <laughs> and heads south. They rendezvous in Tampa. She hitches a ride literally in the cab of the locomotive on the phosphate train, gets over the mainland, gets on another train, goes to Ebor City, where the train station is. Ed arrives, Emily's there. He's on one knee, says, marriage. She said yes. And so they celebrated at the famous Columbia restaurant in New York City, wow. hightailed it over to Lake Worth and got married four days later. Wow. Then he has his orders to go to uh, Ithaca, New York to Cornell University to engineering school. So this is the beginning of Emily's nomadic existence. She's in four and a half years, lives in eight different places. So starting off in Ithaca, New York. From there, he's out of engineering school and is off to Rockland, Maine, where he is the engineering officer on a being built uh, minesweeper in, uh, at the snow shipyards in Rockland, Maine. So now they're in, in <clears throat> Rockland for a while, and then uh, the ship is made seaworthy, and then they move again to Boston for a couple of weeks to get guns and minesweeping equipment. Then she's off in their brand new vehicle and off to Boston. Well, no, wait, we, we've been to Boston. Now they're off to Yorktown, Virginia for training for, at the Mine Warfare School. So <clears throat> she's a nomad. She's driving, he's sailing. Mm -hmm. So gets done with the training, and his ship is uh, assigned to uh, the naval base at Key West. <coughs> this is in early or late uh, 1941. War hasn't started yet, unless you count the Germans sinking the Reuben James. <laughs> Why that didn't start a war? in and of itself. We had to wait for Pearl Harbor, unfortunately. So <clears throat> down south they go. Inevitably, he's this USS Tapicola is his minesweeper. It's in Key West. The naval uh, powers that be say, you know, we think most of the activity when the war starts, and by the way, there was no question that it was going to happen. It was just a matter of when. They moved him up to Port Everglades. That was, Tapicola was the first naval ship home ported in Port Everglades. So uh, very shortly thereafter, December 7th happens, war is on, and uh, all the activity ensues after that. So he's on the Tapicola. They're patrolling <clears throat> the German submarines. Seem to be everywhere, although it turns out there weren't that many of them. They were just really, unfortunately, good at what they were doing. <laughs> Torpedoing ships. Uh, the, you know, these small minesweepers had some anti-submarine capability. <clears throat> Uh, but uh, they spent most of their time chasing the submarines, but not doing the men, unfortunately, and spent a fair amount of time rescuing the crews of the torpedo freighters and uh, oilers right off our very coast here. So later on, <coughs> um, he is transferred to the Turaco. Turaco was another uh, small minesweeper, 
built at, at the snow shipyards, and Ed is the executive officer, second in command. His commanding officer is Allard Hayward. Uh, Allard was not only his commanding officer, but his mentor, and they became very good friends. Uh, somewhere along the line, late 1942, Allard is transferred and is stepped up into one of the new fleet minesweepers, which we'll learn about in a moment. <clears throat> and Ed becomes, takes on his first command as commanding officer of the Turaco, where he remains <clears throat> for until late 1943, at which time he's transferred to the Pacific. Let me circle back to Allard Hayward. Uh, commanding officer, mentor, dear friend. When Dad, later on, is taking the USS Herald to the Marianas to start the invasion of Saipan, Allard is on the USS Tide as commanding officer at Normandy. On the 7th of June, his ship hits a German mine and is sunk and Allard is killed. So very sad. Dad, of course, did not know about this until many, many months later. But uh, at any rate, <clears throat> now we're headed to the Pacific. Emily's in Fort Lauderdale. <laughs> Off to San Francisco. Next part on the nomadic route. So <clears throat> Dad uh, goes aboard a brand new uh, Raven class uh, minesweeper, 220 feet long. State of the art, nothing in minesweepers has been ever built like this in history. And there was a whole bunch of them that were built, fortunately. And then from there, off to the Aleutians. Little known or little ignored fact is the Japanese actually invaded the United States back during the war in the Aleutians. Uh, Atu and Kiska, they occupied both of them. And it was our job to ask them to leave. So the Herald, along with many, many, you know, battleships, cruisers, destroyers, every kind of naval vessel you can think of. It's off to make sure that the Japanese are ushered out. Very vicious fighting on that too, and finally they succumbed. The Japanese, by the way, were pretty well known for their desire not to surrender. So <laughs> these battles were always fierce and, and ugly. So <clears throat> Atu is there, Harold is nearby, but not at Atu. Then they're on to Kiska to get the rest of the Japanese uh, garrison out of there. The Japanese saw the handwriting on the wall and were able to evacuate their entire several thousand man garrison, literally in the middle of the night, very foggy in the Aleutians, by the way, <clears throat> in, during the fall uh, months. And we bombarded uh, airplanes, b uh, battleships and cruisers, went ashore, the Herald going in first to sweep for mines to make sure that there was no uh, obstacles there and the Japanese are gone. So, sigh of relief, no ugly land fighting uh, to be done there. But in the meantime, what's the other uh, enemy of the Navy? Weather. And Dad had some real interesting experiences. One of the worst was actually here on board the Turaco, uh, coming up from uh, Key West after patrolling in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, ran into a uh, Northeaster, which they did not know about, is the, our weather predicting capabilities weren't what they are today, and ended up with uh, the windshield on the bridge of the ship was 18 feet above the water line. Windshields blown out, 12 inches of water in the staterooms up on the third deck of the ship. So that you can imagine, you know, operating in 18 to 20 foot seas and a 97 foot ship. 97 feet sounds pretty big, but when you're in that kind of weather, uh, not so much so. So. Uh, again, back to the Aleutians, horrible weather off and on. <clears throat> He's uh, in Adak Harbor, uh, one of these Aleutian Northers hits, uh, ships being jostled around, and his ship hit a pinnacle, which, you know, these rock, these rock formations that are underwater, very often uncharted because there's so many of them, broke off a propeller, damaged, put a hole in the hull, and uh, so the storm subsides, they inspect, they don't have the facilities and the illusions to make the repairs to this ship. So he is given orders to go to Bremerton, Washington, to the big uh, naval shipyard there to be repaired. So very treacherous uh, voyage under any circumstance when you're trying to do it in a 220-foot ship with one propeller, uh, not so much fun. And of course, the, the threat of the Japanese possibly still being out there is always uh, in mind. He gets to Bremerton and is told to go to a certain pier in the uh, shipyard and said, uh, 
a certain <clears throat> naval officer will be there to greet you and he will coordinate the repairs to your ship. He ties up at the pier, looks down, and it's his brother George. <laughs> so you can imagine the conversation. George is saying, any when we're kids, I spent all this time fixing your broken toys, and now you bring me this? <laughs> so, uh, at any rate, uh, so the, the great part of this is the ship is in dry dock uh, in Bremerton for uh, two or three weeks. Ed gets to hightail it down to San Francisco to meet his new daughter, Joanna. So that was a, uh, kind of a blessing in disguise. Um, you'll see here, passes around, Emily being the nutritionist, and besides being a chemistry teacher, uh, often would associate herself with the local Red Cross to teach nutrition courses to various uh, folks, and also to help with the commissaries on the ships, because there, she said, they, their idea of good food was like started in the Civil War and didn't get any better since then. So, but here's the menu for the Christmas Day <coughs> uh, celebration dinner on the USS Herald in 1943. <coughs> so here we are. Uh, the Herald is repaired, comes back down to San Francisco, San Francisco uh, a little bit more uh, uh, rejoicing and, and getting together with family, and then it's off to war again. And uh, Dad and Emily and Joanna didn't see each other for 13 months while he was in the Central Pacific. So <clears throat> now, early 1944, we were making inroads throughout the Pacific, uh, getting the Japanese out of their various island strongholds. <clears throat> the next big target for the USS Herald is the Marianas. So <clears throat> this flag was flown on the Herald at Saipan during the invasion. You'll notice there are no bullet holes. <laughs> That's good news. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> and then from there, Tinian and then Guam. So he got to participate in the liberation of these places. In addition to uh, performing uh, <clears throat> convoy duty back and forth to Pearl Harbor and some of the other uh, island uh, bases that had been set up for logistical support. A kind of heartbreaking story I had <clears throat> I was on home, I was coming home on leave, and my dad was taking me back to the airport uh, to go back to Yorktown myself. <clears throat> and he told me a story about escorting the hospital ship back to Pearl Harbor. And he said, part of the, you know, you've got all these sailors, Marines, uh, Army troops, uh, Coast Guard, uh, uh, airplane uh, crew, all of who had been wounded and were being taken back to Pearl Harbor for further care. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of them didn't make it. And a daily occurrence were the burials at sea. So dad's driving me back to the airport and telling me this story. Next thing I know, he's, the tears are flowing. I think he had bottled that up for almost 30 years, and it finally came up. So uh, yeah, very uh, tragic. You know, you think about the loss of life and the loss of friends, 10 of his academy, uh, classmates uh, were lost at Pearl Harbor on the first day and then it just kind of you know went on from there 60 uh, during the course of the war so all of these friends and classmates uh, were lost in but this is this is war he was one of the lucky ones so back and forth it's now December of 1944 and he gets orders again this time he gets to go back to the East Coast to Guess where? Yorktown, Virginia. <laughs> so, to be commanding officer of the USS Pilot. The Pilot is another Raven class minesweeper just like this. It had been in the Mediterranean and in the North Atlantic for the better part of its war service. It was back being used as the school ship at Yorktown at Mine Warfare School. Well, Dad's thinking, hey, this is great. We're making progress in the war. Uh, this could be a, you know, he'd been at sea pretty much for three years. He said, I could be here for a year. <laughs> Maybe the war will be over. <laughs> but, well, he's there. And by the way, uh, part of the nomadic story, <clears throat> Yorktown housing, there's the, the naval base there. There's the Yorktown National Battlefield and the little town of Yorktown. Not a lot of housing. So Ed 
and Emily and Joanna ended up living in a house in Williamsburg behind the governor's palace, the house having built in the late 1600s or early 1700s. We think this may have inspired Emily's love of history, having to live in a you know 250 year old house. At any rate, so they're there, they're getting all settled in. Three weeks later, he gets another set of orders. We're going to go invade Japan, so get your ship and take it to the Pacific. So down the coast he goes, through the Panama Canal, up to uh, San Pedro to get more guns because we are uh, involved in the uh, invasion of Okinawa and the kamikaze threat from Japanese uh, airplanes has been around for a few months, but now it's really starting to step up because we're getting closer and closer to Japan and the danger uh, is ratcheting up something fierce. So we're gonna get more guns. Here's what happens with the minesweepers. They're going in first. They are at the most risk of any of the naval vessels involved in an operation like that. So more guns, Ed and Emily. Ed, now Emily has left Williamsburg and is now in West Palm Beach living with her family. <clears throat> so they're, they're looking at the, the odds. What are the odds of him surviving an invasion? Not really very good. So they, he gets in a train, Emily gets in a train, they meet in New Orleans for four days, and they are thinking this might be the last time we see each other. So she comes home, he goes back, gets on his ship, heads uh, into the Central Pacific and then gets ready to go up uh, for prepare for the invasion of Japan. Then the atom bombs, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, war is practically over at that point. The Japanese finally do surrender. <clears throat> His next job is to, <clears throat> he is now a lieutenant commander by the way, so his job is to go to Japan and sweep the mines. This is post-hostility. The mines, the ocean mines are still there. They're still a threat, even though the hostilities have ceased. He's lieutenant commander as uh, that rank he is put in charge of a squadron of 11 ships. So he's got his own ship and these other 11 ships. He gets to bludgeon his way through two typhoons on the way to Japan the time they leave in uh, late August until they get there in September. So <clears throat> 60,000 mines. During the World War II, over a quarter of a million mine, mines of various types are sown throughout all the different uh, theaters in the Pacific, in Northern Europe, the Mediterranean. So that's their job, and he takes his squadron. They're based out of Sasebo, which is just south of Nagasaki. We <laughs> wondered on occasion, and said, were you ever worried about radiation? <laughs> and he said, well, you know, we didn't even know about radiation. <laughs> no, 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 we didn't. So they are there <clears throat> uh, involved in the mine sweeping operations, and we're sweeping not only the Japanese mines, but uh, the Americans used mines dropped from aircraft as an offensive uh, weapon. So there's a picture here, a photograph here. I, you'll have to come up and look at it very closely. This is a mine being blown up in the East China Sea. The question is, was it one of theirs or one of ours? I don't know. <clears throat> but that was their job. So you get to the end of November <clears throat> and finally he gets another set of orders. No. So, Took three weeks to get from Japan to West Palm Beach. A ship, another ship, a train, another train. But he finally gets back, back home, uh, to be reunited with his uh, family. So his war is over. Although, uh, so he's a lieutenant commander. He did stay in the reserves, the active reserves, for thirty. He had thirty-six years in uh, overall. His period of time, uh, ultimately. Uh, made the rank of commander, and uh, we're extremely proud of his contributions. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Let me tell you about minesweeping. This is your course in minesweeping for the day. Uh, mines are insidious weapons of destruction. Uh, we're most familiar with uh, the moored contact mine. You see them in movies, and you've seen pictures of them. Big ball with horns on it. Those are the triggers that set off the explosives that are inside 
the mine itself. They are lured to the bottom and float at a uh, depth where they are more likely to make contact with a, a ship. <clears throat> the, as the war progressed, the technology progressed as well. And it wasn't just the Germans, but the Americans and the British developed the magnetic mines, which were set off by the magnetic field of ships built out of steel. Uh, acoustic mines set off by the sound of propellers. And pressure mines, which also the Allies also referred to as oysters, which were the displacement of a ship going over it would set off the mines. To make things even more interesting, they often had timers. So you could go over a mine once, twice, 10, maybe 15 times. And then the 16th time, bam, it would blow up. The Allied navies, uh, the US and the British Commonwealth, uh, mine sweeping in itself was very dangerous. Four, over 400 ships were sunk, just mine sweepers, just <coughs> doing their job. Um, <clears throat> merchant ships, over 2,000 merchant ships were sunk by mines. Of course, that doesn't count the, the many, many thousands of them that were torpedoed or uh, sunk by aircraft bombing, that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, so mine sweeping was dangerous. Imagine there's a minefield over there. Take your ship, go in there, see if you can find the, the mines <laughs> so, and, and blow them up. I mean, that's oversimplifying it. But the, so, and there are two aspects to the mine warfare scheme. The mines are destructive. If you hit one or detonate one, it's probably going to either uh, terribly damage your vessel or it's going to sink you. The other thing is just the threat of the mines being there was enough to divert traffic and to slow things down and uh, make the uh, make commerce and combat uh, very difficult for the for these surface ships and submarines for that matter. So. Uh, very dangerous. You've got a little diagram here of <clears throat> how a minesweeper goes about sweeping uh, for moored mines and literally cutting the cables. The mines float to the surface and then you've got your various assortment of guns which you try to blow the floating mine up with. Also, the magnetic mine, this coil on here runs off the back of the ship and sets off a magnetic pulse. This, this ship is degaussed. It has a, a system in it that neutralizes the magnetic field. But the cable goes out, goes over the magnetic line, boom, hopefully. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> a little something here too. <clears throat> and nobody on a ship that crosses the equator is immune from this, even the commanding officer. So here's the, uh, the realm of the Golden Dragon, Edward P. Dietrich, on the 8th of July, 1943, Crossing the equator. <laughs> so, that's, be gentle. That, that's the original, so don't don't let it get away from you. <clears throat> so that's Dad's uh, career. Here's the uh, <clears throat> there's the Tapacola, first ship to be home ported at the Port Edward Lakes. There's the Toraco, the second ship to be home ported there. Both and this is first uh, command. Interestingly, the Herald. There are no really good naval archive photographs of the Herald. This is actually a picture of this model that we had made for Dad's 90th birthday. <clears throat> so, and then the, uh, this is the pilot, and of course the, uh, the battleship New York. This is the formal announcement of the end of hostilities. So you can, if you get a chance to come up and you know, read it, uh, that's, and it's interesting, he's in the Pacific, it says Atlantic Fleet. I guess the Navy just, you know, if they had leftover stationery, they would <laughs> <laughs> So <clears throat> that's, uh, that's that. So that's Ed Dietrich's uh, war career. Emily has followed him literally from coast to coast as uh, part of the uh, duty of a military wife. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, do you have any questions, comments, uh, anything? How did they happen to settle in Deerfield Beach? Um, <clears throat> Ed started working, started Deerfield Builder Supply along with Kretz and Hart. Uh, he eventually bought them out. By the way, he built their house in 1947. He built a nice little one-story frame house in Victoria Park. By the way, Victoria Park wasn't as nice back then as well. No, but it was still <laughs> not a bad place to live. Uh, Dad, by the way, was the principal clarinetist of the Fort Lauderdale Symphony back when there was one. And I remember even as a little three-year-old watching him in his tuxedo 
with his clarinet walking out through a hole in the hedge across a dirt road into Holiday Park and then the War Memorial Auditorium for these concerts. <laughs> <coughs> so we're there. But uh, the business is starting to grow and Deerfield eventually uh, moved up to, uh, up to Deerfield. Uh, tried, looked for houses in Boca. They, they didn't like any of them. So. <laughs> we ended up in one of the uh, uh, D.H. Cosby cottages, as I call them, over on the beach in Deerfield. Uh, two bedrooms, one bath, five people, no air conditioning. Uh, the good thing is the, those houses were all built up off the ground on a stem wall with a wood f floor and with a porch that had a, t a concrete terrazzo floor. Uh, that's where I lived until I was about 10 years old. And I was the lucky one since we didn't have air conditioning because the terrazzo was nice and cool. <laughs> and, uh, me, me and the dog, we were, we were in heaven. Uh, okay. So, but that's, that's how they ended up in Europe. Yeah. It was all driven by DBS. So you were born after he came back from the war? I was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just you know, I was hoping it was that part that trip to well, New Orleans. Orleans. <laughs> yeah, I was like in New Orleans was going to be. Well, yeah, yeah, be a story. well uh, <laughs> on that note, my dad is coming back from the Pacific. He gets back here uh, early January of 1946, and my sister Chris was born nine months later. So I guess, <laughs> that just tells you. Everything. And you're the youngest. And I am the youngest. I'm the baby. Now, could you share a little bit about your military duty, too? Oh, I, I could do that. Um, yep, you can see this. There's the battleship New York. Here's the USS Herald. And here's the Coast Guard Cutter Morgenthau. That was my <coughs> only prolonged sea duty. It didn't last that long. We were supposed to be on fishery patrol in the North Atlantic for a month. We had to have the uh, great distinction of, uh, and this was my big law enforcement event of my career. We apprehended a Russian trawler in the prohibited fishing zone. That was a big no-no. And we had to take him all the way back to New York, where we were home ported. So <clears throat> that was that. My wife worked for Forest Boston up off Wall Street in lower Manhattan. She took the Coast Guard ferry to work <clears throat> every day. So she will remind all of us that she has a lot more sea time than I do. <laughs> 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 that was her, yeah, great place to be stationed. I was involved in the uh, Third Coast Guard District, which is, it's been reorganized. There is no more Third Coast Guard District anymore, but uh, Governor's Island was the biggest Coast Guard base uh, in the Coast Guard. About 8,000 uh, out of a small group of 45,000 Coast Guardsmen, active duty. Uh, but a lot of uh, training operations, there were four large cutters, uh, including the Morgenthau Station there, buoy tenders, all the usual uh, craft command facilities, uh, more marine safety. I was one of the assistant directors of auxiliary. The Coast Guard Auxiliary was a huge organization, as you may know. Uh, the third Coast Guard district was the biggest of all of them. It was so big, in fact, that they split it into two parts. Uh, one command structure in Philadelphia and the other one in, on Governor's Island in New York. Plus, we had another one outside of Albany, New York. He took care of eastern New York and Connecticut, and we had uh, upper New Jersey and Long Island. So it was a, and then, you know, you've got your million uh, collateral duties. <clears throat> I stood duty in the search and rescue center. I became, I don't know how this happened, but the, I was the oceanography liaison between Coast Guard headquarters and the New York Ocean Science Lab in Montauk, Long Island. Oh, and that was good. probably the most interesting thing I got involved in. But uh, yeah, that was a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, just again, I, they loan us out to the merchant marine uh, inspection people. If you've ever been in the, in the bilges of an oil tanker or a freighter, it's the worst smelling thing you can imagine. Just, I mean, horrible. And yeah, we have to go down there in our hazmat suits and our hard mats and our all masked up. And this is back when we, this is back in the early 70s. We weren't all that sophisticated about some of those things. But uh, yeah, that's what we did. Yeah, it was a great experience. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's me. <laughs> so yeah, my, my, fa my family history, uh, and I'll go to the other side of the ocean. Uh, Pat's grandfather <clears throat> was a, uh, a sharpshooter in the Swedish army. So we'll give him veterans uh, kudos today. Uh, uh, Jonathan Rich and Jonathan Livermore, uh, my ancestors, were at Lexington, Concord, and Bunker Hill. I'm pretty sure that one of them 
fired the first shot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have proof of that, but well, I'm, I'm also <laughs> But we've had, yeah, um, we've had uh, ancestors in the Civil War. My father's uh, family, his eldest brother, my dad was a little bit of a surprise birth, by the way. His, so he's got, he had an older brother who was 21 years older. Uh, he was an artilleryman and field engineer in World War I. Uh, and then, of course, you've heard about his, uh, his engineer uh, brother, George, who uh, fixed his broken ship. So, <clears throat> but, but yes, yeah, so we've got a little bit of, uh, little bit of history. And then uh, following on from that, uh, our nephew, uh, this is an interesting thing. Dad, having been at Yorktown twice, for uh, first for mine warfare training, and then again for training and uh, commanding officer of the school ship, I was at Yorktown for Coast Guard Officer Candidate School, and then our beloved nephew, Byron Flagg, was also at Yorktown for bosun mate school. So three generations of our family have uh, gone through that lovely, wow. lovely burg of Yorktown. When uh, Deerfield Girl Supply started, mm -hmm. what was the, um, the what were the neighborhoods like? What, were they they're involved with the Cove and, mm -hmm. and other places? I mean, it had to have been not all that developed by the time no, they no, started. They we, we used to harvest uh, Christmas trees in the cove because it was still wilderness. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest rattlesnakes I've ever seen in my life <laughs> I've encountered in the cove. Uh -huh. uh, I remember, so we're in this lovely little cottage uh, over on the beach. Uh, my dad gets his arm twisted by uh, Elliot Stinson and Jimmy Warburg, who were the developers of uh, Little Harbor on the Hillsborough, and said, you know, you really need to buy a lot in here. Mm -hmm. um, which he did for you know, cost principally sum of nine thousand dollars on on the water, mm -hmm. and I thought my mother was going to shoot him. But she said, "We got this great little house. We're only a block and a half from the beach, and you want to move into town into a swamp? That's wow!" <laughs> so, but they did, and uh, they built a lovely home there. <clears throat> I always get a kick out of people saying, "You know, the beach, the the traffic, it's gotten so bad." And I said, "You know, that's exactly why my parents left there." <laughs> But they did it in 1972. <laughs> so all things are relative. <laughs> but yeah, they, yeah, uh, Deerfield was uh, yeah, was a nice little yeah, nice little town. There's a, for those the, the hunters among us, I was not a rabbit hunter, but the, yeah, the hunting just out here by Deerfield Country Club and points west, yeah, it was, it was pretty good. A lot of deer. The bridge went over there in coastal. The bridge went over there in coastal. How was that opportunity back then? Oh. Yeah. <clears throat> It was a, it was a turn turnstile, so yeah, pretty pretty slow. And you know, back in then, you know, our good friend Ralph Krugler, who's the uh, historian of the Hillsborough Lighthouse Preservation Site, is involved in a uh, research study right now about commercial water traffic on the intercoastal before 1920. I don't. It's it's this is a state of Florida thing. I'm not sure what inspired that particular line of inquiry, but the. Uh, so Ralph is working on that, <clears throat> but the uh, back to, as a kid, we remember. Yeah, every once in a while you'd see these little tramp steamers, you know, tooling up and down the intercoastal uh, carrying freight until it, you know, just got. You know, it wasn't economically viable uh, after a period of time. And the, but the turnstile was there. The uh, the Butler, the J.D. Butler Bridge uh, was built in anybody 1950. Seven. Seven? Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Big parade. I remember riding in the back of a pickup truck with a mock up of the old bridge on it. So, <coughs> but that was, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Your experience on Deerfield Island Park. Oh, yeah. We uh, <coughs> practically grew up there. We And by the way, we never called it Capone Island. No. Yeah. Although, if you, go, if you look at all the historical records, the, the the references to Capone go back and forth, back and forth. But the, uh, to us, it was just the island. We would, back then, there was no seawall and there was no condominium there, so we would troop down to the beach. There was a beach on the intercoastal there, if you can imagine that. And we'd get that peach baskets. My mother would uh, line them with uh, inner tube uh, rubber, so they were watertight. Have an inner tube around it, put our camping gear and some food in it, and hop in the intercoastal and swim across. And if we were there all weekend, that was fine because they kind of knew we weren't going to be wandering off anywhere. <laughs> Partly because, depending on the time of year, because there were alligators and bull sharks and things like that yeah, lurking around. But yeah, it was a great, great and, place. And yeah. digging and digging. 
Yeah, we we did we dug for buried treasure, but not Capones. Because <laughs> <laughs> we, we knew that the the, uh, the Spanish and the British had been here back in the 1700s, and we were pretty sure that some pirates had, you know, <laughs> had buried the treasure. Never found it. All we found were gopher tortoises. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Where did you say you lived on the beach? Uh, Northeast First Street. The house is still there, next to the parking garage. Oh. It was built back in, I think, 1943. It's got the original barrel tile roof oh. on it, which my father made me whitewash <laughs> every summer. And <clears throat> I would be up there, and, you know, you, all this bright white, you know, lime paint uh, coating that you're putting on there, and you get snow blind and I would fall off the roof. <laughs> Fortunately, it was only about nine feet to the ground. So my mother would sit out in the front yard with, in her uh, lawn chair, drinking a cup of coffee, get up, come over, check on me. Okay, back up. <laughs> so, and I always asked my dad, I said, why do we have to do this during the summer? It's rainy, it's hot. And he said, because it's more humid and the lime sticks to the barrel tiles better. If you do it during the winter, you'd have to do it like every other week. So that was... Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's a great little place to, to grow up. Yes, ma'am. Well, you say your dad was also a great musician. He was and a, he he was, being a lion cat. Yeah, he was a lion cat, the sunliners. I had to the sun Honey Amadeo's over here. It's so great to see you, by the way. It, uh, the sunliners, the lion cats, probably the best known jazz combo in South Florida back in the day. I remember Thursday nights, my dad was at Naval Reserve training at the uh, air station in Fort Lauderdale. Fridays and Saturday nights, never saw them. They had, they had gigs all the way up Miami to Palm Beach. So that's how he made the vacation money, by the way, according to him. So, but uh, Wink Corwin on piano, Son Amadeo on uh, piano, Bob Ruthenmeyer on bass, uh, Bob Brandt on trumpet. Uh, wow. Yeah, it was a fantastic group. My dad, wow. clarinet, sax, flute, whatever. What a great <laughs> memory. But they, yeah, they were they were pretty fantastic. So, and in addition to his orchestral work, uh, he was one of the uh, he was uh, with the Boca Pops for many years. When the Pops went uh, from a wind ensemble to an orchestra, they only kept two uh, <clears throat> clarinets. Uh, dad was one of them. Uh, Louis Bartoloni, who was the principal yeah. clarinetist of the U.S. Army Band mm -hmm. prior to his right. retirement, yeah. were the two clarinet players. Great memory. So, yeah, he had a tremendous, uh, and then uh, at age 70, he took up the bagpipes. <laughs> 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 and as our uh, beloved uh, Doris, uh, Alan Dietrich would remind us, uh, he looked great in a kilt. <laughs> Eddie, I yeah. want to tell the people about the your dad that I know, the mm -hmm. man, not the sailor. Mm -hmm. Oh, in the 90s, in the Butler house, he would come with his, was it an old Cadillac? Yeah, yeah, yeah. His yeah. old Cadillac, open up the trunk and pull out his tools. And every week or every other day, he was back in the Butler house, repairing, fixing, painting, whatever needed to be done. Never a word, never complained, and that's the man that I know. And I named the street for him because I loved him so much. That's the God's truth. He did so much for that house. And years ago, we're in Kiwanis Club, and, and, and Senior was also. We used to paint that little Kester Cottage, do you remember, in Pioneer Park? Mm -hmm. yep. And they made me get down and paint every post of the... Of the um, fence that was around it. Mm -hmm. This is many years ago. And, and, you, and, you, did, and you did a fantastic job. Oh, well, thank you very much. This, this was in the 90s. So uh, he was always there. He fixed that little cottage. Mm -hmm. he, lo he loved the Pioneer House. No doubt yeah, about. yeah, that was his that was his baby. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he took really good care of it. So these are stories that, you know, you don't hear of the man, what I call the man who I adored. Her. Didn't your mom have something to do with flowers because when I did the shop I did Emily's garden. Yep, she, uh, there were some uh, Cape Honeysuckle uh, growing up around the Pioneer House and, and, and moved over here. Um, unfortunately, they're, they're gone. We'll have to resurrect them. Those, that Cape Honeysuckle came from cuttings from Little Harbor, came from our house on the beach, came oh. from my grandmother's house oh my in God. West Palm, and came originally from the Phipps estate on, in Palm Beach where my grandfather was their kind of staff uh, painter. 
So, okay, well, we have so to make note of that. Bit, uh, uh, by some way, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I miss him, honey. I miss him every day. I yep. just can't tell you the most precious man. And I had a dad like him, too. Uh, let me tell you, he is always in my heart. Well, Thank I, you. I, I appreciate that. Well, you know, we, we talked a little bit about the, the Sunliners, Bob Ruthemeyer. Uh, my dad, Bob Ruthemeyer, Ireland Briggs, uh, incredible trio. And the, there was a fourth, and I can't, I can't remember his name, but part of the quartet at church. And all I can remember is he had a terrible stutter, except when he sang. Right. Uh, oh, right. right. Absolutely yeah. spectacular. Yeah. Beautiful. But that, yeah, that was a, a, that was a great bunch. Yeah. That was a great bunch. Anyone Let's else? Yeah. Big round of applause.